Hi, this is Alex Georgescu, and I'll talk about a few chemical bonding concepts in crystalline materials. Uh, these are things that, as a physicist and material scientist, I've actually found very useful to have a more uh, chemistry perspective. So first of all, thank you for watching. And I should also mention, I really recommend reading um, this book, which to a great extent is what inspired me to make this video and many of the concepts in this book you'll also find here. So let's start with our uh, 1D chain of atoms, the kind of usual example, uh, which has one electron per orbital per atom in this type of chain. And we know that this will have a tendency to have a piles distortion. So the atoms will form pairs and um, just distance wise, they'll just get closer as pairs. And you'll also have the electronic part for bonding and antibonding orbitals. And we know that this will also lead to a band gap opening. And I'll show a slightly different perspective as to um, why this is happening. And of course, it's unclear what uh, drives the symmetry lowering, but what I really want to get into is just that these are ultimately just hydrogen molecules. So if we go back to two um, hydrogen atoms, I think of the one um, S states and add a hopping between them minus T, we can then describe this as a Hamiltonian that has on-site energies that we can just set to zero and an intersite hopping. And the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the system can be obtained by just diagonalizing this. So you have a bonding state uh, with an eigenvalue of minus t, which corresponds to this eigenstate of 1, 1, and an antibonding state, which has this eigenstate of 1 minus 1 and eigenvalue of t. And you can think of the fluctuation and phase as leading to a higher kinetic energy in the antibonding orbital. Or you can think of a particle in a box analogy, but uh, the main difference, of course, this isn't a 1D system. But the basic point is that you then have a hydrogen molecule which has these fully occupied, uh, a fully occupied bonding orbital and an empty antibonding orbital. And this is the electronic structure. And these bonding orbitals stabilize materials, which is something that's quite important to note, as on the other side, antibonding orbitals often destabilize materials. So a helium molecule isn't stable as the antibonding orbitals would be filled and they're just higher in energy. Okay, so we can also take another perspective on block states. So you can first think of these um, molecules or dimers if you want as having these bonding states or antibonding states made out of the 1s uh, electrons. So uh, the bonding state is basically no phase change. Antibonding is, um, you know, 180 phase change. If you go to um, trimer, so three atoms uh, forming a triangle, you'll still have a bonding state, but you'll now have different um, possible phase changes allowed. So here, you know, you go from zero to two pi over three to four pi over three. So you can also go the opposite way. And again, you also have this no change at all. If you have uh, four atoms, you know you can have again bonding. You can have a change of pi over two at a time, or just like in the dimer case, you can have a change of pi at a time. So the point here is that shorter wavelengths are allowed in the uh, longer um, wavelengths. Well, in the longer molecules, actually. Okay. So if we think of these um, block states then on a 1D chain, you can kind of think of them as something similar, but for an infinitely long molecule, right? So this whole equation then just um, ends up kind of much more intuitively simple to understand. So you have this fully bonding state here, which is just what you'd have at k of zero. And then you'd have this antibonding like state here at k of pi over a. But of course, we didn't break the symmetry, so it's not really uh, the molecular orbitals we're talking about. So this is the slowest allowed phase change here. Uh, well, this is the fastest allowed one. You can't really go much faster than changing sign every atom. 
So then if we plot something like a band structure, you know, have the lowest state for um, the K of zero, lowest energy and highest energy for uh, K of pi over A, where A is the distance between atoms again. So going to go back to this um, band, longer wavelengths will be in the middle, just slower uh, fluctuations, but higher than none at all. If we think of the dimers forming, we then have this new unit cell with these atoms forming pairs. And these atoms with these pairs are now 2a apart. So how do we think of this? Well, one thing is that k of zero state now includes both bonding and anti-bonding states in this new unit cell. Um, so k of zero now looks like this. You have basically this bonding state and this anti-bonding state. Uh, k of pi over 2a has these bonding states fluctuating in phase every 2a, while the anti-bonding states also fluctuate in phase over 2a. So here there's just uh, a lot more fluctuations in phase. So if there is um, no distortion, you know, these two states here are degenerate with distortion, the degeneracy is broken. So the basic point is you see, these are also in phase, these are in phase, but this is a smaller distance than this one. So ultimately what matters is this bonding um, is over this antibonding. So how do we think of this? Well, we take our previous band, we fold the bands to, K, uh, to pi over uh, 2a, and then we have something like this. We have this bonding uh, band here that starts from this state and goes all the way up to this state. And then you have this antibonding um, band that starts here and goes all the way up to here. And again, note that without dimerization, um, these two states would be degenerate. So you'd have something like what I was showing for the um, chain of four atoms. Okay. Another important thing to note is the terminology in physics and chemistry in this case um, is a little bit different, but it often means the same thing. You can refer to this as a top valence band if this is where the Fermi level is. So the highest occupied molecular orbital, if um, you're thinking about chemistry with the context that here you have a large crystal that's basically the molecule. Uh, and here, this is the bottom conduction band or the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Okay, so now I can think of a very simple hypothetical one-dimensional PD model. So this is similar to what you'd have in some transition metal compounds, but of course, they're usually not 1D. So this is a very toy model to kind of illustrate the point. You have a D orbital, have a P orbital, there's a hopping between them. And again, you have this matrix where the initial energy of the D state is higher than the energy of the P state. Bring them together, have a bonding orbital, anti-bonding orbital. Okay. So um, what do we do with that? Well, assuming it's just this, it's not some chain. First, you have an the eigenvalue of the P orbital is shifted down as you go towards the bonding orbital. And the other important thing is that this bonding orbital is actually mostly P in character. The antibonding orbital is mostly D in character and its energy is shifted up. Um, and the um, eigenstate of the antibonding orbital is mostly D in character. So again, this is mostly P in character. This is mostly D in character. And this is quite important. So if you look at energy levels, you go from D orbital to antibonding, P orbital to bonding. Uh, an example, you know, it can draw some PD bands, and this is pretty simple. Again, you have this distance A, you have this bonding state here at K of zero. Uh, then you have the bonding state at K of pi over A. So here you change the phase as you go from one unit cell to the other. And this is a bit lower in energy because here the phase is the same as opposed to different as here. Antibonding at K of zero. Um, you know, this is actually lower in energy than the K of pi over A, as here these are in phase, and this is not in phase. And 
uh, we can then plot some bands. Um, and again, we're assuming here that the PD um, orbitals are actually closer in the unit cell than they are um, from each other with from one in cell to the other. And we can get this bonding band here. Um, again, K of zero, higher energy, lower energy at K of pi over A, antibonding band here, um, lower energy K of zero than at K of pi over A. So, okay, we now have these two bands and you can also look at the densities of states for them. And again, you see these are kind of very different in energy spacing here. Okay, but one of the interesting things is that this antibonding orbital, as I was saying, here is mostly D in um, content in character, while the bonding orbital um, also has some D orbital projections. And this amount depends on the material. And you have the opposite thing for the P orbital projections as this bonding orbital has most of the P character uh, in most cases while the antibonding has some. And the energy difference between the PD is uh, the charge transfer energy. Okay. So the reason I bring this up is because very often there's a um, conversation about PD models and an accurate PD model will have to include PD hopping, initial energies of the P and D orbitals, and money functions, which are uh, type of orbitals I get to that correspond to P and D orbitals separately. On the other side, you can also build models that include antibonding orbitals alone, for example, especially if the Fermi level is here and you're building what's called a low energy model or a D only model. So in an antibonding picture, if you just shift the antibonding orbital energies around, this will just, this will obviously affect their occupation in a very straightforward way, right? You move them up, they um, get um, less occupied. In a full PD model, this isn't the only thing that happens because you also change um, the character of the antibonding state. So this leads to a more complex picture. So for example, you can go up in the antibonding energy, but also lower the amount of D orbital projections. So it's not trivial to know that the D orbital projection uh, amount will actually increase or decrease. Well, the part that's occupied. We don't know if the occupants will increase or decrease. So this is kind of very important, particularly in um, <clears throat> rare earth nickelates that I discuss quite often in my work, because you can either have antibonding um, orbitals that are often called D orbitals, though it's unclear whether that's the best um, terminology, or, and their disproportionation, which you see as an occupation difference, or you can think of ligand holes on the P orbitals, often with no change in D occupation at all, because there's also a change in covalence. So ligand holes here meaning holes on the P orbitals. So um, this is why it's important to be accurate in the way we discuss things. So a quick note on the approximation is that the approximation I've used here is usually called the LCAO or linear combination of atomic orbitals, which assumes that you, know, you take these atoms, you bring them together and you can just approximate everything as a linear superposition of them as I did with bonding and antibonding here. Um, there are limitations to it. So obviously, if you take two hydrogen nuclei and you bring them very close together, you'll basically have um, helium instead, at least electrostatically, right? Uh, not thinking here about um, neutrons. So it's very um, difficult to capture the full electron wave function of what would basically be a helium atom using only the atomic orbitals from hydrogen. So this is why this picture isn't always fully correct. Now, this is a very extreme example. Uh, LCO usually works quite well, but the main point is that there are some limitations. And that's why often in solids, what we do is we actually build complete bases of um, one year functions from things like DFT calculations. So here I'm showing an antibonding orbital in titanium chloride 
where I'm showing this A1G or Z squared titanium D orbital character in the middle and chlorine P character. And you can see that um, there's antibonding um, character here, right? So the uh, plus here matches the minus of the titanium and um, of the titanium D. And here you have the reverse with this ring. Okay. And the important thing to note is that one-year models can be built for both orbital-like and bonding, anti-bonding only models. So you can build uh, models for anti-bonding-like things like I was showing before that will look something like this, or you can have the um, orbitals separated into different one-year functions. So thank you so much for watching this. Um, I hope you found it useful. And again, I really recommend um, reading this book to have a slightly different perspective on um, bonding in solids. But whether you're a physicist or a material scientist or a chemist, I found it very informative. Thank you.